preacher, and it's the Reverend Louis Andrews. Louis um, is the grandfather of Molly and Bennett Andrews, and they're in the balcony right now helping uh, ring the bell. And uh, he has other children, and his bi biographical history and things that he's done are right here, so please read about that. And I also want to mention that there's a special song that Louis will use today somewhere in the middle of the sermon. And it's printed on the back of your bulletin. And so at, when it comes time to, for that, Louis will reference that. And so you'll have to look for that for that song. A couple of announcements. Um, we are receiving the two cents a meal offering. It's usually on the second Sunday of the month and that's also printed in the bulletin. And um, today there's an announcement about Christiansburg Vacation Bible School, which will be in July. It's not here at the Presbyterian Church this year, but it is at Park United Methodist. And um, Dinah Arnott would appreciate if you would contact her if you have an interest in participating. So that's in there. And I would like for us to all, re whoops, sorry, uh, remember in prayer <clears throat> the following folks. Um, Mark Thomas, who is T Tammy Craft's brother-in-law, Evelyn Kimball, Mary Childress, Nicholas Keeling, Susan Daniels, Carolyn Relly, Randy Thompson, Jason Hammond, Herb Miller, Patty Walker Jordan, and Fran Hart. Are there any other prayer concerns that you want to mention? All right, the only other thing is there's a yellow sheet in your bulletin for the Sanctuary Flower Reservation. And so if you uh, feel like reserving a spot for your flower, remembrances, there's that. And please fill in the attendance in the pew and tear out the little white sheet and put it in the offering plate today. Thank you and welcome to worship. glad people are taking care of things I didn't know about. That's wonderful. So anytime you want to do something, just jump right in and that'll be great. And I think you're supposed to do it. Let's join together in our call to worship. Our God calls to the heavens above and all the earth. Our God remembers the covenant with Abraham. I am your God and you are my people. Our God is a witness to our troubles. Call out and I will deliver you. Our God remembers and responds. Nothing, not even death, can separate you from me.
Let us pray together. Oh, gracious God, as we gather this day, remind us we are not the first to sit in these pews. Before us were our mothers and fathers. Before us were teachers and pastors. Before us were folks who crossed every T and dotted every I. Before us were folks who were risk takers. From our beginning until today, these pews have been occupied by folks who came to praise you and be surprised by your holy word. You were here from our beginning. You are here today. Lead us into tomorrow, O oh God. Lead us into tomorrow. Amen. Please be seated. On Sunday morning, within the safety of these walls, we proclaim nothing can separate us from the love of God. But we live in a Monday world where until reality clashes with God's promises, let us together confess our brokenness. God of both day and day, deliver us from darkness which clouds our judgment and threatens our sanity. In the daylight, we clearly see the road which leads to tomorrow. But at night, as our trust begins to waver, we suffer from fear of the unknown. Lighten our darkness that we might separate truth from fiction. Lighten our darkness that we might continue in the unfolding of both our days and nights. Help us to discover in places we never imagined. In Christ's name, Amen. Has spring ever failed to follow winter? Has new life remained submerged in the earth? The blooming of God's love is, a never, is never controlled by the hours of the day or the seasons of the year. God's love never fails us. God's love and grace are forever. Thanks be to God. the children or anyone who feels childlike to come up and join me up front. So I'm really old and decrepit, so I'm going to use a chair. Is that okay? Good. Okay. I want you all to say five words for me. God so loved the world. Can you say that? God so loved the world. All right? Now, I've got a balloon. I had a balloon. Is this the right one, Molly? I've got a world, that re a balloon that represents the world. Once upon a time, God looked out on the world and it was all drab and it didn't have any colors or plants or animals and God said, I don't particularly like that. And so God blew God's breath. <laughs> And he said, let's have some colors. What colors would you like? Oh, okay. And God said, I'd like some animals. What animals would you like? Rat, cat, dog. 
a little bit more for the giraffe, right? And what about rivers and lakes? Do we have rivers and lakes? Mm-hmm. And trees? <laughs> it's not going to pop. It's not going to pop. And what else do we need? Anything else you want to put on God's world? Flowers. And God said, this is so beautiful, I'm going to keep it to myself. But God didn't do that, did he? Did God? God said, God so loved the world, God gave. So, well, we get that. So God's breath went where? All over the world. And there were trees, and there were flowers, and there were animals, and there were giraffes. And then God looked out, and the people weren't very happy. And God said, I've got to make the people happy, right? I've got to give them something. What makes you happy? What makes you happy? Chicken? <laughs> Say it out loud, Molly. Oh, good, okay. What else makes you happy? How about ice cream? And popsicles. And loving one another. And if you got too many coats, you give one to somebody else, right? And sharing. It's a great list. What else are we leaving out? Yes, sir, I believe so. And what else? Yes! And God put this into one person, and that person's name was who? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. And Jesus said, I'm going to keep this to myself. And God said, no, you're not. You're going to spread it out among everybody, right? <laughs> and wasn't that wonderful? Yeah. Well, now it's been 2,000 years, right? And now God's going to give you something. What's God going to give you to help other people? Compassion, yeah. And kindness? Very good. What was that? Oh, okay, yeah. I don't know why waffles, but that's all right. And love? And peace? And understanding? And really good music, right? Now, you're going to keep that to yourself? No, you're going to let it go and let it go all over the world, right? Why? Because God so loved the world, God gives. And so should you. Now, we can have a prayer together. And if you can find those balloons, you can keep them. All right? Can we have a prayer together? Gracious God, thank you for loving us and giving us... And giving us the opportunity to love others. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. <laughs>
text today comes from the 12th chapter of Genesis, the first through the fifth verse. And God said to Abram, Go from your own country and your kindred to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name known, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abram took Sarah and did as the Lord commanded. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now once upon a time, when I was much wiser, I preached on this text. And the sermon, if I remember correctly, began something like this. In a dream, God said to Abraham, I know they gave you a gold watch at the retirement ceremony. I know that you and Sarah are planning to cruise down the Euphrates. I even know you put a substantial amount of money on that country club membership. Well, hold on to your hat. I've got plans for you. I, I was 35 when I preached that sermon. Deb and I, with our two children who were under six, lived in a rented house with no air conditioning in Wilmington, North Carolina. We owned one car. Deb worked part-time at a doctor's office, and I was an associate minister. And I got to tell you, when I was 35, I absolutely loved the Abraham Sarah's story because all that Deb and I had were dreams. If God said, load up the U-Haul and head west to parts unknown, I mean, who was I to disagree? So I recklessly proclaimed to that poor congregation God could be speaking to any one of us and then paraphrasing one of my favorite theologians, the late, great John Prine, I proclaimed, if God wants me to throw away the paper, blow up my TV, move to the country, eat a bunch of peaches, and find Jesus, who am I to say no? And half the congregation thought I'd lost my mind, and the rest were certain of it. <laughs> Well, now, I'm 72 years old. And on revisiting this text, only one little phrase jumps out at me. Abraham was 75. <laughs> Today, Deb and I live on a golf course by a lake in the mountains. We own two cars. Our children have families of their own. We're not about to go anywhere. So what do I do with this text this morning? Well, I quickly retreated to see what the other text was, and you guessed it, it was John 3.16. <laughs> and I'm sure you've all heard it. God so loved the world, he gave his only son that everyone who believes will have eternal life. That text practically preaches itself. No leaving home, no canceling tea times, just believe and everything's gonna be okay. Thank you, Jesus. So ignoring the Abraham story and enthusiastically clinging to John's gospel, I hopped in my car 
turned on the radio only to be bushwhacked by Iris Dement. I don't know if you know Iris Dement or not. Listening to Iris can be a little difficult, not just because of her Arkansas twang, but because through the years, Iris has always challenged me with her peculiar version of God's good news. So since I had no sermon to preach, I decided to let Iris preach for you. Look on the back of your bulletin. You'll find the printed words. I'm going to turn on the song, or at least I think my son is, and I want you to listen. And if you want to, just tap your toes and have a good time. sitting in that car and I nearly ran off the road because that song hit me right between the eyes. And when she sings that little part about a baby lifting out its arms, I, I remembered being allowed by your session to take part in the baptism of two of my grandchildren right here in this sanctuary. 
and, and that's, that's a big deal. Not just, not just for Molly and Bennett, not just for David and Sherry, but for everyone who's a member of this congregation. You see, on most Sundays in the average Presbyterian church, folks don't have much opportunity to participate in the service. You sing hymns quietly wondering what on earth was going through the minister's mind when he picked that one, and why don't we just sing those good old songs we really like, right? <laughs> You, you, you're forced to pray a prayer of confession you didn't even compose. The offering plate is passed around restoring the guilt which has just been relinquished right after the prayer of confession. And when the service is over you feel required to say something to the minister about a sermon you've already forgotten. There's not much, not much participation in a Presbyterian service. But when there's a baptism You are active. We, God's frozen chosen, promise to warm up to a child by making a couple of promises. We promise when the child comes to these doors, somebody's going to be here to open them up and they're going to tell her that she's loved. We promise to tell the child the story of a a baby who grew up and healed the sick and preached God's word and proclaimed the poor and welcomed the poor and discouraged and dismissed no one and died for everyone. You know, John 3.16. We, we promise to be part of that child's world even though many of us will not witness the finished product. Now, raise your hand. How many of you have been baptized? If you've been baptized, raise your hand. Right. Yeah, yeah, most of us, right? Do you remember who baptized you? <laughs> Do you remember those folks that made that promise? Are they still around? Probably not. But the fact that you're here tells me that they did their job. Now I know today's world just feels a lot different. When we were children, the pews were full, everybody went to church, and it was easy to fulfill those baptismal promises. The church didn't have to compete with a lot of other things back then. But not today. Every week, another church closes its doors and turns into a coffee shop. And that's downright scary, particularly when you're searching for a new pastor. And I know that you believe your search committee is going to find a wonderful preacher with 12 children who just happen to be named Peter, John, Matthew, James, etc. But oh my gosh, what if Jesus takes a call someplace else? <laughs> Let me remind you of your history. Christiansburg Presbyterian Church was organized in 1827. I'm a historical interpreter at Monticello, so I know that's one year after Thomas Jefferson died. <laughs> there were only 24 states in the Union at that time. And this church has witnessed wars, and it's witnessed depressions, and it's witnessed multiple catastrophes. This church has survived the Ford Edsel, the new Coke, and seven remakes of the movie's Jaws. I mean, how is it even possible that you're still here? Let me let you in on a couple secrets about how churches survive. It's not because of the preachers. It's because of the people in the pews. Churches thrive when folks in the pews are thinking as much about the folks outside this church as they are about themselves. And churches survive when the outside and the inside come together to form a warm, healing, compassionate community. Remember Abraham? Yeah, that was 10 minutes ago, right? 15 minutes ago. Abraham had retirement all planned out and God said, 
I want you to do something new. For the last 195 years, your congregation, your, congress, your con congregational ancestors must have been about the process of rebuilding and renewing for 195 years. And what was their inspiration for such a radical thought? First seven words of John 3.16. God so loved the world, God gave. God so loved the world, God gave. It is in giving that others receive. It is in giving that you find your purpose. It is in giving that we all become lovers. It is in giving that our doors always remain open. It is in giving that we find the faith to keep working on that world.